One problem that paleoarchaeologists and paleoanthropologists, who study ancient humans face, is that they frequently disagree on what classifies as a human species, and they also disagree on which species to classify specific specimens. In fact, a purebred human being does not exist, and never has. For Crania, Petrolona, Sacopastor, Carbwe and Bodo, stand out as being quite distinct from the others, we don't know why their sinuses are so much larger than those of their relatives. It could indicate that they are a specialized group. They have very large brow ridges, which have been implicated in social signaling, and large sinuses would reduce the weight of these. For example, two 250,000-year-old Neanderthal skulls discovered in Sacopastor have been identified as the earliest known in Italy, at least by some. Even there, debate rages on, as the Sacopastor skulls deviate from the classic Neanderthal model. The Sacopastor fossil cranium was discovered near Rome in a gravel quarry. Its Neanderthal morphology was established early on, and subsequent detailed works describe a combination of features in which late Neanderthal traits blend with those shared by Middle Pleistocene hominins. Through the integration of past and present data, this video aims to synthesize and describe the current information available about Sacopastor cranial morphology. Among those dated to this period, this specimen is the best preserved and most complete in Europe. Investigators believe its Neanderthal identity suggests that the impact of the preceding cold stage, which occurred between 200,000 and 130,000 years ago, was most likely decisive in the definition of the Neanderthal phenotype, modifying the extent of genetic variation in previous European populations toward a more homogeneous gene pool. The second Sacopastor skull is a male and is missing the entire vault, as well as the left front orbital areas and a portion of the base. Because one is a mature female and the other is a young adult male, the morphological differences between the two skulls may be the result of sexual dimorphism. The very large cranial capacity is estimated to be between 1,280 and 1,300 milliliters, and the facial size is smaller than that of a classic Neanderthal but larger than that of the first Sacopastor skull. This places the discovery at Sacopastor a quarter million years ago, and the slightly abnormal Neanderthal skeletons of Altamura around 150,000 years ago. Archaic Homo sapiens, a group of hominins from the Middle Pleistocene, exhibit morphological and behavioral characteristics that place them in an intermediate position between modern Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. Archaic Homo sapiens were typically classified as members of our species due to possessing brains of nearly modern size, yet were distinguished as archaic due to their primitive cranial morphology. But what about the archaeological evidence, that is also commonly cited in favor of uniting the Neanderthals with us as Homo sapiens, that they had cultural behaviors, such as burying their dead and painting pictures on the walls of caves? Well, interesting as that is, it should be excluded from the biological classification of species, since behaviors are potentially more fluid, evolve more quickly, and spread more easily within and between species than traits based on anatomy and DNA. Indeed, some species or groups within fossil humans had very distinctive patterns of frontal sinus morphology. Neanderthals tend to share a similar size and shape. Fossils like Petrolona, Wado, and Carbwe have very extensive, large frontal sinuses, which are very different from Neanderthals, including early members of the Neanderthal lineage. Carbwe is an extremely well-preserved specimen that displays a very prominent brow ridge containing a very well-developed frontal sinus with a honeycomb-like structure within it. This is similar to the Petrolona skull, so sinuses can provide an insight into how ancient human skulls changed over time. While their function remains uncertain, the sinuses offer a new way for looking at human evolution. Irrespective of how they formed, others have suggested that sinuses have one or more putative functions, such as olfaction, respiration, thermoregulation, nitric oxide production, voice resonance, reduction of skull weight, and craniofacial biomechanics. The changing shape of the frontal sinuses is revealing more about how modern humans and our ancestors' brains evolved. This part of the brain is responsible for processes that distinguish us as humans, such as speech, emotion, and planning, 
and the sinuses are now providing scientists with another way to infer the development of this part of the brain. The frontal sinuses also provide a novel way to investigate the relationships between ancient hominin species. Sinuses are fascinating morphological features in fossils, but they have received little attention. Many papers that describe new species fail to mention them, and they are frequently only illustrated incidentally in relation to the rest of the specimen. Sinuses are air-filled cavities within the skull bones that are lined with a mucous membrane. The maxillary sinuses under the eyes, the ethmoidal sinuses between the eyes and nose, the sphenoidal sinuses to the outside of the eyes, and the frontal sinuses are the four types of sinuses in humans. While they have been known about for centuries, their function is unknown. Suggestions that they produce nitrogen oxide to protect the nervous system, from infection or provide thermal and shock protection can help to explain their current function, but not necessarily why they evolved. Some researchers have even proposed that sinuses are an evolutionary spandrel, a structure that evolved as a byproduct of something else and had no initial function. Later in evolution, further adaptation may give it a function. The precise path of human evolution is still a source of contention, with numerous competing theories about how our species evolved and how many close relatives we have. Examining the sinuses of extinct species could help with this. This new study examined 94 fossil hominins from over 20 species to gain a better understanding of frontal sinus variation and what it reveals about human evolution. The researchers created 3D models of the frontal sinuses using CT scans of the specimens, allowing them to digitally reconstruct the structures. These models were then used to take measurements that could be compared across species. While sinus size could not distinguish between early hominin species such as Australopithecus, it could distinguish more recent Homo species over the last two million years. The researchers discovered that species like Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo sapiens have distinct ranges of sinus size, which they believe could be linked to evolutionary constraints caused by the development of characteristics like larger brains. The research also reveals new information about our own evolution, demonstrating links between these sinuses and the size of the frontal lobe in Homo erectus and later. The size of the sinuses is consistent with the development of a short extension of one of the brain's lobes relative to the other, a feature shared by most humans and possibly associated with the dominant hand. Undoubtedly, the Petrolona skull has compelled anthropologists to reassess their theories regarding the genesis of Homo sapiens, commonly referred to as modern humans. Unfortunately, the skeletal remains were also unearthed, but, they were subsequently misplaced prior to the completion of any examination. Despite the absence of the jaw, the Petrolona cranium exhibits a near-complete state, displaying remarkable similarities to specimens found in Bodo and Kabwe, which is also referred to as the Broken Hill Skull. These specimens exhibit a combination of Neanderthal-like features, such as prominent brow ridges, a posterior skull ridge, and robust cranial bones, along with certain traits observed in subsequent species, including a relatively larger brain size, akin to Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. The subject of how to handle middle Pleistocene hominin fossils that do not fit neatly into the modern Homo sapiens clay, both in terms of morphology and behavior, but also cannot be definitively classified as Neanderthals, has been a topic of extensive discussion among paleoanthropologists. Occasionally, these fossil specimens have been designated as archaic Homo sapiens, although alternative nomenclature has also been employed. The majority consensus among paleoanthropologists is that Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens are separate and distinct species. The primary morphological features exhibited by Homo neanderthalensis include a cranium that is elongated and positioned at a lower height, a distinct supraorbeal torus, a noticeable narrowing of the cranium behind the eye sockets, an inclined occipital torus, a cranium that is widest at its base, the lack of a prominent chin, and a cranial capacity of approximately 1,000 cubic centimeters. The primary morphological features exhibited by archaic Homo sapiens include an average cranial capacity of 1,200 cubic centimeters. Additionally, these individuals display a level of encephalization that positions them between modern Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. Furthermore, 
archaic Homo sapiens exhibit a degree of cranial robustness that falls between that of Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. Lastly, in comparison to Homo neanderthalensis, archaic Homo sapiens possess a more rounded and less angled occipital region. However, a diverse assortment of hominin fossils from various regions during the Middle Pleistocene period, which do not neatly align with either Homo erectus or modern Homo sapiens, have frequently been classified as archaic Homo sapiens. The African fossil specimens encompass Bodo and Kabwe, whereas the Western Eurasian fossil specimens comprise Petrolona, Ceprano, and Sacapastor from Italy. This suggests an intercontinental relationship between these archaic Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, which genetics has recently been proved to be the case. The presence of shared cranial characteristics among numerous European and African fossils has provided evidence to classify these specimens as archaic Homo sapiens. It is noteworthy that Petrolona exhibits a brow ridge that is predominantly hollow, a characteristic that distinguishes it from other fossil skulls. Similarly, Kabwe displays a partially hollow brow ridge. Nevertheless, a perceptive observation made over 50 years ago highlights that certain anthropologists employ specific and generic names solely as designations for specimens, without attributing any biological significance to them. Hence, one could contend that paleoanthropologists, in certain instances, employ particular and general designations without robust evolutionary biological foundations. In essence, the utilization of distinct specific and generic names serves the purpose of distinguishing various groups or regional populations. Consequently, certain scientists have proposed that archaic Homo sapiens should continue to be regarded as a plausible alternative, primarily due to the challenge of definitively assigning some mill Pleistocene hominin remains found in Europe, Africa, and especially Eastern Asia to a specific species. However, it has been observed by certain paleoanthropologists that substituting one imprecise designation with another imprecise designation does not significantly enhance our comprehension of the phylogenetic connections among hominins in the Middle Pleistocene era. This understanding is crucial for elucidating the origins of modern humans. The hominin fossil record is subject to diverse interpretations due to the existence of different schools of thought. The grouping of archaic Homo sapiens fossils from Africa and Europe has generated considerable scholarly discourse within the field, especially the classification and relationships between these specimens. Reproductive isolation is the key to understanding how new species form, and many types of barriers can divide a population and split it into two different groups, geographic, morphological, behavioral, and others. After isolation, if members of the split populations encounter one another and cannot produce viable offspring that can themselves later successfully interbreed and produce viable offspring, then these two populations constitute two different species. The Neanderthal subspecies did not go extinct, because it was never a separate species, instead population pockets of Neanderthals died out around 40,000 years ago, whereas other Neanderthal populations survived through interbreeding with their modern human brothers and sisters, who live on to this day. And with that tantalizing statement, we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our human history. Until next time, stay curious, and stay questioning.